Nancy, thank you so much for sitting down with Forbes. Oh, my pleasure. So you've been named one of the most influential business leaders in the Bay Area, one of the foremost impact investors on the planet. You have placed early and successful bets on some of the biggest companies operating today, Tesla, Farmers Business Network. It's quite the entrepreneurial journey, and I want to take a step back and talk to you about the beginning of that journey. Your father was a patent attorney and an inventor, and your mother worked on policy. Is your current line of work preordained by, <laughs> by who your parents were? It's, it seems that way, doesn't it? And, and yet I never really figured that out until a few years ago, because for me growing up, I was one of five girls, and so there was no um, gender stereotyping in terms of what chores we did. And so my father was always inventing things in the basement and asking for help, you know, soldering a wire, whereas my mother was out campaigning for the local mayor race or whatever and needed help distributing leaflets across town. And that all seemed very natural to me. And, and uh, so we, as growing up, we got to do a lot of things. And, and bringing together their two passions is, is pretty much who I am. Would you evaluate his inventions the way you do <laughs> startups today? You know, it, it, it's funny because he gave us jobs. And, and it, when it's your father, you're not quite so liberal with uh, criticizing. Or, or and Plus, we were we quite quite young. But one thing he knew from the beginning is uh, how to get us to, to be excited about a project, like think of the name for a new product he invented. And he would promise to take us to the ice cream store and give us an extra large sundae if he chose the name of that product, if, we, if he chose the one we came up with. So he, he had a very good sort of motivational psychology, even though he was an engineer. <laughs> He understood incentives quite well. Exactly. But you went on to go to college, and you didn't study finance or accounting. Can you tell me what you studied and, and the first few jobs you had out of college? Because I think all of this is interesting. Yeah. And not only did I um, not study finance or accounting, I almost didn't know what they were. And if I had, I certainly wouldn't have liked them. <laughs> I was much more of a humanities, social science, um, culture uh, really interests me, and, and I, I actually got a, ma a master's and first a bachelor's in anthropology, which people don't quite understand, but to me it makes a lot of sense, and that, that's because anthropology really studies behavior and culture, and why do people do the things they do, what, are the, what do gr uh, groups bring together in terms of language or institutions or uh, behavior, and why does it click? And when you think about that, that's kind of how you analyze a startup is, will, will it be successful? What's the culture? What's the leadership? What are the norms? So there, there's, a, there's a connection there. But it took me a long time to, to connect those dots. I started very early in public interest activities, in environmental regulation. I went the, the day after I graduated from college. I moved to Washington, DC. I was an intern for the Sierra Club. Uh, learned about uh, the role that the government can play in, in defining protection of public lands, for example. And that really has been a passion of mine for forever, the nature and our, and our responsibility to protect it. But turning that into a job other than interning for the Sierra Club and working in, the, in that space was a lot harder and didn't come until later in terms of blending finance with with uh, social and environmental progress. So you started on the NGO side. When did you shift to the dark side of <laughs> capitalism? Yeah, well, I, what happened is I worked in Washington. I also worked at uh, Stanford Medical School on a, on a job that studied how innovation happens in medicine and what role the public should play in helping to shape it, kind of ahead of its time in that sense. And so in, I knew I loved innovation and why, why it worked and, and when it didn't. Um, but I decided that rather than just look at it from the government or academia or, or the NGO, I needed to learn about business because obviously that, or especially around here in the Bay Area, uh, innovation was happening in the private sector. And so I decided to go to business school to get the skills in, or, in order for me to move into a private sector orientation. I think I read somewhere that after business school, you knew you needed a job, and the traffic in the Bay Area was one of the motivating factors in looking for a job. How did, 
it was the Bay Area traffic what landed you in investment banking? <laughs> uh, it, it was one motivating factor. So I worked at Intel uh, after graduating from business school, which was a fabulous place. It was new and, and uh, you know, very innovation driven. When I got engaged to be married, my, hus my husband had a medical practice and he lived in the East Bay. And so even back then, a long time ago, the traffic driving from, say, Berkeley to Santa Clara was horrendous. And so it, it is true that uh, I had a forcing function that, that pointed me towards a job in San Francisco. And so I, even though I loved Intel, I decided that I, I didn't want to commute. And so I looked for a job in, in San Francisco. And this is why I became uh, a professional in finance. It's because back then there were no tech companies in San Francisco. It's pretty hard to believe today. Uh, but what, what, what did exist in San Francisco were some of the early finance firms, investment banks, venture capital firms, to back the, the tech revolution. And so I ended up working at one of those, Hamburg and Quist. Were you looking with an impact lens even then, or did that come a little later? For me, the impact has always been part of who I am, but it, it was expressed at varying levels throughout my various jobs and, and never fully uh, evolved until you know, starting the first impact fund. But what I did do, for example, at H&Q, I was able to get a securities analyst, analyst job where I studied uh, instrumentation and reported on instrumentation stocks that at the time were, say, uh, analyzing what were in Superfund sites. So I, I was able to do something that was environmentally and health related. Then fast forward to later in my career at, at H&Q where, where I had turned into, where I switched to venture capital, I was also responsible at H&Q for our public affairs, our political work, our, our philanthropic giving, mostly because no one else was interested in it, and I, I was. Uh, and so that really was a way for me to express some of the, the interest in those sectors that I didn't as a venture capitalist. And then uh, finally, in the, you know, in the time right after the dot-com uh, boom and bust, we raised our first fund that combined those, those two jobs into one. And that's what became DBL Partners. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain for the Forbes audience what DBL stands for and what it means? So DBL stands for Double Bottom Line. And by that, we mean that we invest for two bottom lines. The first is financial, IRR, return on cash, what everyone else does. The second is where we distinguish ourselves. We invest to drive social, economic, and environmental improvement in the sectors and regions in which we invest. And so from the get-go, that's been our, our creed. We, we do believe that the two goals enhance each other, that they don't diminish one the other, the other at all. And that was a fairly controversial belief in the early days. But today, uh, you know, almost 20 years in, we're seeing this become mainstream. It's become much more mainstream, but let's go back to when it was controversial. What were people telling you? Did people say, you're crazy, don't do this, or they just didn't believe in the investment thesis? What was the feedback? Well, for, for one, they were very upset about their venture portfolios because they had just lost a lot of money in the dot-com demise. And so even talking about vanilla venture capital was a little hard there for a few years. How, however, even worse for many people was to this overlay of a do-gooder venture capital <laughs> But that did not compute for people. And the reason is, is because back then, many people believed that if you introduced anything other than a return on investment, a financial imperative on your investment approach, you would, you would threaten your returns. If you thought of some social outcome or an environmental benefit, it would show up as reduced returns, concessionary as we call it now. And so that, that was a very common belief. We, we kind of led with the opposite. We believe there's no sacrifice, that you can do both. But it was only a belief back then, and so it took us many years to, to prove that there was, not only was it not concessionary, it could be a very strong, no sacrifice financial strategy. 
Were there certain investments or exits that you had in the early days that helped you prove your case faster? Sure, it, because what you have to show people is that when you invest in a fund, you have the idea, you have the, the acumen to make these investments, but they have to be successful. And so it took a while. It didn't happen overnight, obviously. But we invested very early on in the solar industry. We invested in a company called Powerlight, which was sold to SunPower and is now one of their larger divisions. We invested in Tesla, very famously. We invested in Solar City, another um, very strong rooftop solar player, years and years before they were household names. And so as those companies, which went through many, many uh, problems, the, those early days of sustainability companies were very difficult for lots of reasons. But as they began to succeed and grow and develop a revenue base that was you know, very impressive and could take them public or be acquired at a good multiple, uh, that's when people began to let go of some of these biases that had been so deeply held. Were you the first institutional investor in Tesla? We were in the first institutional round. We weren't the only one, but yeah, we, we were. What did you see about the company at the time? I, I've read that you've called it a risky bet. Well, part of that was because all of my colleagues on Sand Hill Road would say things to me like, what are you doing? We don't invest in car companies. This is like not Detroit, what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, so there was a lot, not a lot of uh, warm and fuzzy support um, for, for that investment. And no one had ever done it before, really, in, in this region. And, and so the notion of how you develop a car company that, that has all of this manufacturing and, and uh, design work and you know, has strong incumbents um, on the internal combustion engine side, it was daunting. Um, and, and so there was, it was not popular, and it was very hard to raise money for, for Tesla in those early days. What's your, your view on the company now? I mean, <laughs> Tesla is, is an icon. It's, it's really what's showing us how to get to a sustainable future. Seeing Elon Musk take on Twitter and some of the other distractions, would you still make that investment? I would. Uh, for all of the, the talk about Elon, and, and obviously there are lots of opinions about him all, all over the map, you cannot deny how prescient he is, how hardworking, how uh, sophisticated he is in his view of our collective sustainable future. Is there truth to the rumor that you told him to cool it with the personal jet for his carbon <laughs> footprint? <laughs> That was a long time ago, <laughs> but he, as usual, he's, he's very, uh, always has the retort. I suggested maybe that wasn't great for him to be flying around in his personal jet a long time ago. This was like before we were public. And he just wrote right back saying, uh, Tesla is my carbon offset. <laughs> <laughs> because he was putting a huge amount of his own capital into that. So that first ever fund that DBL raised, that was a little bit of a struggle getting institutional investors on. You're being very kind. It was brutal. It was brutal. OK, <laughs> I, we can call it brutal. How would you compare? Because you closed fund four in 2021 at $600 million. Mm -hmm. Compare and contrast the, the, the yeah. closing <laughs> of each of these. Sure, night, night and day. Uh, and we, could have re we were oversubscribed on that 20. 21 fund, which going back to fund one in that uh, two, uh, 2003, 2004 period, we had a goal of 75 million and we just clawed our way to, to that. And the reason goes back to what I talked about a few minutes ago. It just was too new. People didn't like the asset class. They certainly didn't like something that uh, combined a social agenda perhaps with financial return. And so the Big investors in Fund One were banks who were, who were able to invest out of their CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act uh, pocket, because we paid attention to putting companies in low-income neighborhoods if we could. And so that was something they could do. And then foundations that shared our mission to deliver the benefits of entrepreneurial activity more equitably across society. And now you have investors. I I think I saw some pension funds. How would you characterize the investor pool, the LP pool? Yeah, so 
very niche investors in the first fund, very traditional investors for venture capital in, in this recent fund, and even in, in our third fund, too. The um, pension funds, uh, family offices, foundations, endowments, some insurance companies, some corporations, looks very traditional uh, today. Did you ever imagine it getting to this point? Not at all, because it was such a, a, a sort of a searing memory in, in, in terms of how, much, how many no's we got from those uh, constituents, uh, constituencies in the first round. I never dreamed that eventually we would be able to tap into those sources. We're speaking in a moment where there's a lot of consumer appetite for ESG goals and impact investing, but there have been more state legislator proposed rules against ESG investing this year than last year. At, as of the end of April, it was 99 proposed state-by-state state rules, and it differs state-by-state, state, but that, there were only 39 last year. You have Governor Ron DeSantis signing sweeping re legislation against ESG investing. Are these state laws a threat to your business at all? They're really not. We're, we're more focused on impact, and impact is more oriented towards positive outcomes as opposed to um, you know, screening for negative practices or, or keeping score. And so we, we focus on, for example, not just the environmental benefits of the electrification of transportation, but the job creation benefits, the ability to put new uh, car, car plants in neighborhoods that need those jobs. So most politicians, when they actually know what we're doing, uh, like that, I mean, because who, what politician doesn't like, you know, cutting a ribbon at a at a new company facility? So, what's your message for this current political moment for those who might have skepticism around ESG or impact investing? Hang in there. I, I think that our results are positive for both our investors and for society, and that the politicization of this activity, which we're seeing now, will pass. And because we saw that in the um, 2008, 2009, the whole solar industry was under attack. And now, of course, solar is on a tear and, and more, more money is being invested in renewables now, I uh, just read, than in um, fossil fuels this year. You've talked about CRAs and investing in um, areas where job creation is needed. One of the publicly available reports on your website for investors talks about this is where the headquarters are. It's in a low and middle income area. Can you talk about why that's part of your investment thesis and it's not just the offsetting the carbon footprint or the environmental good and why you're analyzing the areas in which headquarters are being built? really goes back to our origin story, working with uh, the Bay Area Council and some foundations. The Bay Area Council is a leading regional business group here. And they were getting criticized back in that post.com era for, for not having even economic development in our region. And they wanted to make sure that entrepreneurial companies settled not just in the traditional uh, Palo Alto or Santa Clara area, but in the neighborhoods that really needed those jobs. And so that, that really became one of the things that we measured from the, the get-go. We worked with the Ford Foundation to, de to develop our metrics. They were one of our first investors. And it really has to do with something that now is, is uh, even more of a problem than it was back then, just the, the haves and the have-nots. We have a society that really doesn't always distribute the benefits of of technology and innovation the way it could. And so we really do, it's not like we force people, you know, go site there, go site there uh, in, in terms of pointing to low-income neighborhoods, but we do educate people that these are, these are neighborhoods that uh, are worth a try. We've talked about how you were early in on Tesla, early in on Farmers Business Network. I think Pandora was an early successful bet. What do you consider your most successful investment? <laughs> Well, of course, we always say as venture capitalists, our, our portfolio companies are like our children, and so of course we don't have a favorite. <laughs> um, but and, and I do think that some of the companies we're working on now will eventually have huge impact. But in, in terms of just the, the broad reach, I, I think that Tesla, you can't really uh, say anything else because not only is it the size of uh, 
of what it what it's doing. It's the importance of what it's doing. It, it really is a wake-up call to everyone on this planet that we need to do things differently. And who doesn't love cars, especially in, a, in the United States? So it's a great way to teach people about the importance of sustainability, in addition to being a, a colossus as of a company. On the other end, what's an investment or a company that you still think was a good idea, but didn't work out the way you wanted, maybe the market wasn't ready or it went under. Is there anything that comes to mind? As you'd well, like of course, we all have our, <laughs> our troubled companies and failures. Um, it's good you ask, because yeah, it's important that people see that out of these failures come, come learnings. And so we had a company back in the 2008 timeframe that is so, what it did is so common now, but it wasn't then. It was called Elephant Pharmacy. And it was sort of a Whole Foods for pharmacy. You could get your yoga mats and your, your Eastern medicine, as well as your pharmaceuticals, all under one roof. And it was very educationally oriented, which uh, you, know, is, you can get that today. But back then, you know, it was either go to the traditional pharmacy or go to a, a, a more of an alternative kind of a, a pharmacy place or yoga studio. And that, so I just, I loved that company. Uh, it was doing well on its metrics in terms of same store sales, and it was going to open some more stores in the region. But you know, 2008 came. Um, we had a bank loan. Uh, it just didn't. It wasn't able to stand on its own two feet yet uh, because it was still a, a young company, and the the bank got scared. And banks, of course, back mm. then were being. Uh, scrutinized by, by the federal government and so it was too risky for a bank and even though we had a, a buyer uh, the bank kind of put the kibosh on that so that's a shame I feel like I would use that yeah. service. Yeah. and that that sounds exactly like what I was asking something that was a little early for 2008 but in 2023 it could have been uh, yeah it could have been a contender yeah exactly what excites you about this moment in 2023? What are recent investments or investment theses that you're looking at that you think is the wave of the future? Well, the good news is that now investing for sustainability and investing with an impact lens is, is very, very uh, prevalent. And you, you know, millions, uh, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in sustainability and, and developing not just the capital, but the talent. People are coming from other industries to, to have this be their signature uh, uh, company that they develop that makes a difference. Uh, and the, the, the effort is very, very diverse. So we're looking at, you know, we're way beyond just solar, wind, and electric vehicles, although there's still more to develop there. We're looking at things like natural climate solutions. Uh, look, when you see the the fact that wildfires uh, are happening and if if wildfires were a country they'd be number two behind China in terms of their carbon emissions so it isn't just the devastation of, of natural lands or homes uh, the loss of lives it's also the carbon footprint of our wildfires and and the, the ill health effects and and when you actually peel back the layers of the onion you begin to see that while we have amazing firefighters and, and approaches to controlling fires, we don't get to them until they've already spread in many cases, and then it's much harder to put them out. And part of that is that we don't have the technology to marry with the, the, the insights that firefighters have to, to control fires. And that some places are using helicopters left over from the Vietnam War, for example. And so there's been an innovation drought. We can, we can work on this. You develop better tools. You don't have to have uh, people in, in these firefighting planes all of the time, for example, just like we don't always now in warfare, we don't always have people in the planes. We're using drones or other autonomous vehicles. You can get to fires in minutes if you put together AI and sensors and, and uh, digest the, the information available available to you from those those kinds of technologies. Oh, and that's interesting. So it's taking the tools of ag tech, some of the preci precision farming and mm -hmm. AI tools that farmers are using to grow their crops, but applying it to wildfires. Yeah. Is there a company doing that? Or is that the technology you want to see built? 
Yeah, no, there are, there are companies working on this, like the ability to perceive a fire ahead of when it's, it's going to happen. And it, it does come from things like precision ag, also from the military. I mean, drop, it's, dropping a bomb on a place it requires all kinds of perceiving and knowing what your target is. And so taking that military aerospace technology to wildfires, why not do that? And so there's a company over in Alameda, for example, that's uh, called Rain R A I N, uh, that's that's working on that and and developing ties with of all sectors the the aerospace military industry, which it surprised me. I, I going into it, I didn't realize that there were some parallel parallel acti activities here. That's fascinating. So that I imagine is part of what you're looking to deploy fund for. Yeah, and also um, we're looking at logistics, the ability to deliver products um, uh, quickly and cheaply, but also reduce the carbon footprint, figure out you know, shipping, a, say, an artificial heart to a, a patient or a, um, various medical um, applications. How can you reduce the carbon footprint of that and still save lives? What's next for DBL? Is there a fun five, or is it way too soon to <laughs> talk about? You said you were oversubscribed. Well, for definitely, we're we're here for the duration. We you know we're pioneers in this, and we we feel a responsibility to to stay with this and help the field grow. And we're having a lot of fun. I would say the current market isn't the most fun, <laughs> but we've been through cycles before, and we know that we'll we'll come out of this one. We also don't raise funds as frequently as some other funds do. We're, we're kind of on a four or five year. Um, we don't put all the money out at once. And so, but in the next few years, we'll be definitely coming back. When you say this current moment isn't the most fun, we are in a tough economic cycle. Are you seeing a bright light? At, is, uh, is the end of the tunnel near? I know valuations have plummeted. It's been, it has been tough going for venture capitalists and entrepreneurs alike. What's your grade of where we are right now? Well, I'd still give it a, like a C plus because the, the capital markets, the IPO market, there's, there's absolutely no FOMO on the part of investors right now. So, and we do need that for, for the um, exits and for really developing the, the popularity of the sector. However, that, you know, we always, we, we know that it will come back. So I don't get too depressed about that. And it's really a good opportunity to teach younger entrepreneurs, to teach your younger colleagues about what it means to live through a cycle and that we, we do need to pay attention, not just to growth at all costs, but to uh, growth, you know, sustainable, if you will, to, to looking at um, the ability to grow without raising more and more rounds. So that is a lesson that's it's never an easy one the first time you learn it, but it's an important one. And, and there was a little craziness in, in the market over the past few years. So even though I don't wish this on anyone, um, it, it, it does serve a purpose. Brings the temperature down just a little bit. Yeah. You come with very valuable perspective, and that's part of why we're speaking with you today. It's for the 50 over 50. And one of the things I'm curious to hear from you is how does being over 50 affect your current line of work? Is it an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, it's mostly a, uh, an advantage. When you have, you know, when you've been a founder of a firm and you're still at that firm, uh, you have a lot of flexibility. And so for me, uh, the ability, as I was just saying, to help younger people uh, learn about how to get through cycles to, to help them identify what they're really good at and, and help them build their careers and move through um, the, this cycle and understand how markets work and when inflection points occur all of that that's um, a big advantage because I've you know been through that several several times I would say that in terms of the, the disadvantage certainly and I have many many friends in this position, it isn't as easy for older professionals in, in a down economic climate to you know, get the promotion they want or, or switch jobs or advance their own career. So I'm very mindful that it, you know, that it isn't uh, an unqualified, uh, easy, easy street for folks. And, and uh, so I do, I, 
I do worry about that and just in terms of how, how people end their careers mm. or move toward the latter part. And for, you know, the disadvantage, I don't want to be a Pollyanna that everything's fantastic, you know, when you're over 50. Um, you know, certainly, you, you know, the, the ability to have the high energy to um, make sure that you're able to, um, you know, kind of keep at it. I, I think that really is something that if you work, start working on it when you're younger and you pay attention to self-care and sort of keeping your, your, um, your own personal life in balance, that, that helps at, at, this, at this time. And in, in some ways, when you were, you're really busy after you're 50, your, your kids are a little more independent or they're even going to college. And so um, that's another advantage. We heard from someone on the 2021 list that they were told that venture is a young person's game. Why are you even bothering doing it? So <laughs> it's interesting to hear the ways that you see the advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, young people in general, and I, I have two young adults as, as children, and they, you know, everyone thinks they're the center of the universe and they're invincible and that the world re revolves around them. And so that's fine. It's, and, and there's there's no need to kind of argue about that, but what we can lend as, as people that have you know been out there uh, making mistakes, having successes is is uh, an insight for folks as to how how they might want to do something a little differently. We talked about how you started your career. Did you ever think in your 20s and 30s about what your career over 50 would look like? You know, I didn't, because, and part of that is because I was so busy. Um, when you are in a job like a securities analyst or a venture capital in, a, in, a, in this environment in, in the Bay Area in the, when I was that age, and you have a young family, you're almost like, okay, pedal to the metal, just focus, get through day by day. And so I didn't spend as, as much time thinking about what I would do uh, towards, you know, more towards the end of my career. I was just getting through um, the, the, just the surviving. current one. And plus, obviously, I stayed at the same firm. I mean, we were acquired, so we became part of J.P. Morgan. But I was there for over 20 years, so um, I was a pretty happy camper. But then you became an entrepreneur. Do you consider yourself an entrepreneur as we sit here today? I do now. Um, I, I definitely understand the you know the visceral uh, feelings that go into founding a, a company and, and the difficulties as well as the enormous triumphs you can and and successes you can have but I, it was hard for me to to get my arms around that in the beginning because as I say I I, I didn't have the the interest I just I loved where I worked and I didn't mind being part of a, a big company. So it's a, it's a lesson that um, perhaps you, sh you should try things that maybe, maybe you don't think you are because once, once I made that switch, I was you know, the typical, why didn't I do that sooner? Really? <laughs> so what's your advice for your younger self? <laughs> to, to go for it, I mean, to, to be more open to the idea that you are more than just the comfortable sum of the parts that you that you are at that time. Shake it up a little bit. <laughs>